Welcome back, class. So I want to apologize for my light shirt. I know that's going to make it a little more difficult to see what I'm writing on the board. It's not impossible to see, but just a little bit more strenuous on the eyes. And I usually remember to not wear a light shirt when I record these videos, but today uh, I'm, I forgot. So my apologies. <coughs> so the first reaction that we want to talk about today is the chlorination of methane. So here's our methane, here's our chlorine, and you can see that we have our methyl chlorine right here as our product. Now when we look at this, we have, how do I know it's a radical mechanism? Because it's going to tell you, it's going to often have something like light. Whenever you see light above the arrow here, it's, it's definitely going to be a radical mechanism. Another thing, if you want, this uh, methyl chlorine right here, you have to use the methane in excess and you're going to limit the amount of chlorine that you have. Because if it was the other way around, if you had your methane and you had excess chlorine, right, plus excess chlorine, what you're going to do is get polychlorination. So you'll get something like this. You'll, you'll replace all four hydrogens with a chlorine atom. Whereas when you do it this way, you see that you only get replace one hydrogen with the chlorine. Unless explicitly uh, stated in the problem, you're typically going to have the mindset of this reaction right here. You're only going to add one chlorine. But if you have excess chlorine, note that it's going to replace all of the hydrogens. But whenever we're going to talk about this reaction or this uh, condition, we have to explicitly tell us or write it down and say what's going on, okay? But when it's just written like this, okay, forget the product side, when it's just written like that, you're just going to assume that is an excess that is limiting. And that will promote only one fluorination event. So what we want to be able to do is look at this and how does the mechanism work? And remember, there's going to be three steps. There's the initiation step, and then the propagation step, and the termination step. The propagation step, well, I'll stop it. Let's go back to the initiation step. So what's going to happen is, maybe I should label it. We'll label it one for the initiation step. So we are going to have our chlorine, chlorine, chlorine bonds, rather large, a large bond. And when we treat it with light, it's going to turn into a radical. So that chlorine, chlorine bond, so we already have the lone pairs. It's going to, the light is going to bust that chlorine-chlorine bond to give us two radicals. And oftentimes it's just easier to show that this is a radical by not drawing in the lone pairs. If you just go like that, then I know we have some radicals and we're going to have two of those radicals. So that is our initiation step. So in step two, or the propagation step, we're going to have our methane, and I'm going to draw it just a little bit differently. Do you see how I, t I still have four hydrogens? I just drew three over here, and then just one extended. And what's going to happen is we're going to have our chlorine radical here. I'll draw the radical on that side this time. And what's going to happen is it's going to react in such a way that it's going to form another radical. And so we're going to have this carbon-hydrogen bond now react in this manner, like that. So when we follow those arrows, I see this radical is reacting with one electron from the carbon-hydrogen to give me HCl, hydrochloric acid. But what do I have left over? I have my H3, boom, like that. Now I have a carbon radical. 
Now I can take that carbon radical and <clears throat> do a abstraction here. So I can take my carbon radical right there, and then I can treat it with another chlorine molecule. Now when we do the initiation step, the light does not convert all the chlorine in the reaction into radicals. It converts a very small fraction of the chlorine into the chlorine radicals. So we still have a, an abundance of chlorine present. And so what's going to happen now is we are going to do that halogen abstraction step where we're going to have this come, this come like that, and then look at this. What do we get? We now have made our product. Oh wait, made a mistake. That is not a hydrogen. The arrows are showing it has to be a chlorine. But what else did I generate? I generated another chlorine radical. So now this can keep going and tr uh, it can keep reacting with another methane molecule. And when you do this reaction, you'll gen generate more radicals. So the reaction propagates itself. It keeps doing what it's going to do until all the radicals are gone. And then for the reaction to stop or the termination step, we have to get no more radicals. And so there's three ways that this can happen. You can have two chlorine radicals get real close to each other and that will turn back into chlorine. So that will stop the reaction because you can see two radicals reacting and now in the product there's no more uh, radicals. That's one possibility. You could in fact have what we've seen already. All right. This is also a termination step when you form the product. Okay. So this step right here is um, this step right there. Well, it's getting well. It's not a termination. We're getting the same product. You see how this and this is the product there, but it did it in a different way. It formed our product, but no radicals were created. So that's a termination step. So yes, you can get some of your product from a termination step. This and this are the exact same thing. I just have the hydrogens here swapped in different orientations, but that, that's okay. Now, another radical uh, step or a termination step that you could envision happening, and I'm going to put it over here. You could have a methyl radical get really close to another radical, methyl radical. And when those two species get close together, you could uh, have them react, shown with our arrows there. And then what would we generate? We would generate ethane. So that would kind of be like a side product that we're not too interested in because our whole goal was to generate this compound right there. But that's how the reaction can stop is from these one, two, three termination steps. And eventually you're going to use up all your radicals and the reaction will stop. Okay. So if we take a look at if we had excess chlorine, what we have now is a process called a chain reaction. And so if that chlorine was in excess, what's going to happen is you're going to then replace another hydrogen with chlorine. So now we're at CH2Cl2. And then that's going to react again if you have excess chlorine. Cl3, and then eventually you will get all of the chlorine to replace all the hydrogens. All right. So this right here 
when it just keeps going and going and going, we call that a chain reaction. Okay. And so the mechanism from chain reaction to chain, or this process right here is going to be basically the same thing that you see right here. It's just now the, this starting molecule right here looks a little bit different. All right. So what would the propagation step or, yeah, what would the propagation step be for this guy right here? I'll start us off and then you guys can Figure it out on your own. This would be a good step here, or a process here. So if I have our CH3, I could draw it like this. Let's draw it like H2 carbon, H like that. And then what's right there? There's my chlorine. So this molecule is this molecule there. So what would happen here? We could have a chlorine radical right here, and we would just do the same mechanism here. That's not how far I want to go. We could go like this. And then what would that generate? Another radical. It would be chlorine radical. Just like that. And then you could take this species right there and do this same step right there. Right there. Okay. Perfect. So let's, let's take a look at some other things now. I'm going to clean this board. Now let's take at, let's take a look at radical initiators. Radical initiators are going to initiate the radical reaction, right? And what we've seen so far is when we take a look at chlorine. And if we shine some light on it, so we shine some light, we're going to get a radical process going, and then we would get our two radicals like we've seen already, right? Okay. But this chlorine-chlorine bond uh, is strong in comparison to other bonds. Let's say if we take a look at a uh, peroxide, like that. If we shine some light on this guy, we will have a radical process here, a homolytic cleavage, and we could get some a radical like this. Now, what's the difference here between these two? They're both doing the same thing. Well, please also remember that you could also initiate a radical mechanism by adding heat. So if we look at it in terms of heat, this chlorine-chlorine bond is going to be stronger than this oxygen-oxygen bond in this peroxide. So the energy required to break the chlorine bond is 243 kilojoules per mole. But to break the peroxide, it's a whole it's a whole lot less. 159 kilojoules per mole. So what that does for us is like this reaction, in order to get the chlorine to turn into radical, it has to be temperatures greater than 100 degrees C, but to do this reaction, it's going to be around 80 degrees C. So there's a difference in temperature. So we don't have to use such harsh conditions. If you look at it in terms of light, for chlorine, you're going to have to use UV light, and for the peroxide, you, you can use lower energy light to get the radical to get going. So we also have acyl peroxides, where it looks something like this. Like that. Almost looks like an anhydride, but it's not. It's an acyl peroxide. And so we could form, shine it with some light or some heat. Same concept here. 
We'll generate our radicals. But this auction auction bond is even less strong than this auction auction bond. So it even jumps down or decreases the amount of heat to 121 kilojoules per mole. So a little bit easier to work with. So it's just about making these initiating steps a little bit easier. <coughs> so that's, that's pretty cool. So you could envision here, and I just noticed that I chopped off all of this right here as I'm looking at the computer screen now. So I bet you can already figure out what it is if you listen to what I said. These, this is just talking about light and heat. So that's what all these symbols here. So the symbol for light is what? Planck's constant times nu. So that symbol right there is what is being cut off over here. So my apologies. Now you can have radical initiators, but then you can also have radical inhibitors. Inhibitors. Well, got to step us to the side a little bit so you can see that that. So a very common radical inhibitor is elemental oxygen. So O2. When we take a look at O2 in its Lewis structure, we can see that it looks like this. Yeah. But you could also represent that uh, oxygen molecule or that Lewis structure like this. We could take one electron, put it there, and then one electron, put it there. And then it, we could see something that looks like this. And now that auction looks like a di radical. And that di radical right there is going to consume any radical that's in the reaction. So if you're trying to do a radical reaction, you have to remove all the elemental oxygen from the reaction because that's going to terminate the reaction. Another inhibitor that's common, commonly used is the hydroquinone. So let's draw what that is. Okay. Another radical inhibitor, we'll, we'll put it right here. So hydro, that's a Q-quinone, like that. Okay, and the, the way that molecule looks, maybe I can get it down here. Let's see if I can. I think I can. Like that. So we have a benzene ring with two alcohols attached to it. So that's hydroquinone. Just know that that is a radical inhibitor. All right. But by looking at the time of the video, I think this is going to be a good time to stop. We're going to end this video now.